Perfect. <laughs> Are you on? Yeah. We're on. Welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce our mentor speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Amy Haas is an expert, and even though she doesn't say she's not, she's really an expert in heart rate variability and understanding the technology of HRV, and particularly its application within chiropractic practice, and how this amazing tool can be utilized not just on a research level to show efficacy for chiropractic care, but actually show positive outcomes measures so that uh, the average chiropractor in a practice doesn't need to be a researcher at all, can utilize the information to enhance their patient care, their care, the recommendations for care, and follow through with care. So, Amy. We are ready. Let's go. Where are we? Oh, we are. At the Mass Alliance for Medical Philosophy, is that where we are? I think so. In Western yeah. Massachusetts, yeah. the longest continually running uh, is a philosophy program on planet Earth. We have our origins back in the early 1980s as the Cairo Group, and have been doing philosophy nights every month, every single month, mm -hmm. second Saturday of the month since the 1980s. That's before now, most of you were probably born. And uh, anyway, not me. I was 1973. <laughs> Um, all right, we were also going to talk about our amazing upcoming 2018 uh, MACP speaker list. Yes. Um, the board has created something super duper awesome, and I'm totally so excited to share, share this. This is a pre release of our uh, schedule. Upcoming philosophy nights for 2018. We have January 13th board presentation. We're going to have some fun that night. We're going to talk about great things that have happened in our practices. So memorable moments. What's that? Memorable moments. Memorable moments. So it's going to be inspirational and a great opportunity to share. Uh, February 10th, Kevin Palace. Um, March 10th, Dave Fletcher. April 14th, Ted Corrin. Anybody interested so far? Um, <laughs> May 12th, Ron Oberstein. June 9th, Rob Sinat. July 14th, Jen Steinberg and Pam Jarbo, the dynamic duo. And August 11th, of course, we have our annual picnic. And then September 8th, Autumn Gore. October 13th, Liz Anderson Peacock, who I hope is watching. And November 10th, Carlos Bogosian. And December 8th, Iram Tahir. So Whoa. we have a rocking program. Oh, yeah. program coming up. Very, very stoked. Um, thank you guys. Thank you guys for being here on this snowy night. I don't know about the rest of you, but my drive here was from hell. And um, oh, I'm glad you're here. No, yours wasn't, was it? <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm glad to have made it here in one piece. I may be crashing on your sofa tonight, but yes. that's a different story. Um, I'm also glad that we have our friends with us on Facebook Live. I know some people are going to be joining us from all over the place. I'm totally excited because this is something new I've been working on. And um, I think it's good to feed everybody's souls with something, kind of a bigger connection. And there's an interesting series of topics we can all start a conversation about with this that I'm hoping this will inspire people. So, um, side note, I'm trying something new tonight. Um, habitually, my presentations have been a little bit buttoned up because I was trained as a scientist that I should be very proper when I present. I should use proper posture, proper words. Um, screw that. Um, <laughs> I just finished. You know you're wicked smart. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Alan. One of my patients got this for me. Um, I profess to be wicked smart, but I'm really wicked goofy, actually. Um, I just took a sem seminar called the Landmark Seminar, and my possibility is to share myself and my brain with others. And that means not hiding behind the buttoned up. That means really what are the contents of my brain. So I'm happy to share this with you this evening. And um, I will invite conversations about this. Um, so we'll start with chaos theory, adaptation, and chiropractic. <laughs> and I've run a joke between myself and many of my patients. It's all connected. Or at least you better hope it is. What we're going to talk about. What is chaos theory? How does it relate to order? How does chaos theory show up in the human body? How is chaos theory reflected in Stevenson's 33 principles? 
I'm going somewhere kind of interesting with this. So I think we're going to do some exploring. <coughs> and uh, fourth question, what the hell does HRV have to do with chaos and Stevenson's 33 principles in chiropractic? So we're going to tie that all together in one intriguing bundle and see what happens. So chaos. We were just talking about this. Chaos is not just the state of my desk. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, thank you, Christine. I hope you're watching this. Um, you keep everything in my life in order, and none of this would be possible without you. So thank you. Now, lately, my desk actually has been a little bit more clean, which is nothing shy of kind of weird. It means something's probably brewing up here. Um, so, how many people in the room want to watch South Park? One. Okay. Um, do you remember Professor, Professor Chaos? Kind of? I think I do. He is, and I, I will become the greatest agent of change in the universe. Chaos is an agent of change. Bottom line. So, um, that's why my other name is Professor Chaos. Chaos theory is mathematical modeling of the behavior of dynamic systems that are highly sensitive to initial conditions. So what that means is uh, like if you are hitting a, if you're playing pool and you hit the cue ball into the, into the triangle, every single time you do it, it's going to break differently. Very sensitive to initial conditions. With the apparent, within the apparent randomness of complex systems reside underlying patterns, feedback loops, and self-organization. You guys know about the decreasing orders of magnitude, what may appear to be very chaotic from here. When you work your way out and look at things from a bigger perspective, all of a sudden order is evident that could not be perceived from your particular level of magnitude prior. So where you start determines where you go and different outcomes can result from the smallest change in initial conditions. This is the butterfly effect that we're aware of. And this is also reflected in chiropractic. I think BJ said something about that. You never know what you do, how that can affect the lives of days of the life. You know better than I do. <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Was that? You know how far Yep. Um, so, again, initial conditions. This rack will break differently every single time according to how you hit, hit it. And it appears to be completely chaotic, but it actually follows the order of physics. Another example of a chaos process is this fantastic little pendulum. It's a double pendulum here, and when you look at it, just each individual movement that the pendulum does, it looks like it's going nowhere. But lo and behold, with time, a pattern appears out of... Yeah, it's not going to work. Well, there was a cool YouTube diagram, but yeah, you can look it up. Go ahead. Let's see. Peter is way too curious. Okay. It worked for something. Peter's got everything under control. So you start from one initial condition, and you appear to have a series of just randomized motions. But when they're repeated, a pattern actually emerges from the randomized motions. So this defines a chaos system. Again, a chaos system is a relationship between order and disorder. Or order out of disorder, as it is. Isn't that neat? Looks like a gymnast. What's that? Yeah, it looks like a gymnast going around the uh, uneven bars. Mm -hmm. So, fractals. How many people in the room know what fractal is? Okay, a fractal is a pattern. It is a mathematically determined pattern within a pattern within a pattern. And we see this all over nature. For example, the Fibonacci structure is a fractal. And any of these three plants here are fractals. Can you guys think of any other things that could resemble fractals in nature? Shells? Yeah. Spirals? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, spirals and shells, um, the universe. Um, uh, I'm not going to go. Cannolis. Cannolis, yes. <laughs> mm. 
Well, no, everything else. Everything else. What? Are you hungry? Um, so <laughs> artichokes. That's what I meant. Artichokes. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Artichokes. Yeah. That's another uh, pattern within a pattern within a pattern. And with every every uh, order of magnitude, you go deeper into the pattern. That pattern will be repeated. So that's what's observed in any of these structures here. Pattern within a pattern within a pattern. So, major premise, Stevenson's 33 principles. We're all very familiar with this. There is a universal intelligence present in all matter that continually gives to it all of its properties and actions, thus maintaining it in existence. So, raise your hands if you agree that's pretty consistent with chaos theory. Yep. Interesting fact, Joy. The human body is actually a chaos system. And we also know this through Stevenson's 33 principles and in general from chiropractic philosophy. We are a continual relationship between order and disorder. Order is created by innate intelligence and disorder by universal intelligence. So structures within the body have an order that may not be immediately perceived, but a closer examination is definitely present. There are patterns in the body that actually mathematically are fractals. Therefore, they are components of a chaos system. The, uh, there are three examples right here. Um, we all know principle 21, the mission of innate intelligence. To me, the most interesting evidence that the human body is a chaos system, these are pretty neat, but the neatest one is actually the brain. The brain is some of the strongest evidence that we could come across that the body truly is its own chaos system. So I'm going to read this to you guys. It's, it's small word. Sorry about that. Our brains are full of fractals. Again, those are a characteristic of a chaos system. In fact, they couldn't function if it were not for fractal geometry. The human brain comprises approximately 100 billion neurons. Amazingly, there are about 100 trillion synapses or connections among these brain cells. That's an average of 1,000 connections per given cell. Though many neurons may make a single, but others may have thousands and, and hundreds of, of connections with other neuro nervous system cells in the brain. Um, the next one was the interesting one. It is the fractal branching pattern of the neurons, axons, and dendrites that allows them to communicate with so many other cells. The fact that the brain follows chaos math is at the basis of our, of our ability to use our brain the way that we do. I know it. Um, if neurons were shaped like cubes and then neatly packed into the brain, only one neuron could only connect with at most six other cells. So this is an interesting philosophical point. A lot of traditional approaches to understanding the human body involve a linear thinking pattern. A plus B results in C. But what I'm showing you here is that the body follows nonlinear dynamics. Therefore, applying a linear rule to a nonlinear system doesn't work. In short, part of the way we have been addressing the human body in modern medicine at a basic philosophical, physical level, that math don't work. Interesting thought, huh? You didn't tell that? What was that? You didn't tell that? No, you can't. <laughs> so, the relationship between chaos and order. You could say that innate intelligence helps to organize things within our body to create order out of chaos in a process that some of us refer to as salutogenesis, or syntropy, which is the opposite of entropy. And this, in turn, the other side of the cycle, can degenerate when order is not maintained through a process of pathogenesis, otherwise known as entropy, increase of disorder. So this is something I'd like for us to uh, have a conversation about in the social hour afterwards. Kind of a fun slide, which encompasses a lot of things. So yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh oh, Peter's asking a question. <laughs> well, the, the implication in that. Uh, which is the deeper thing of where we want to be this hour, 
is the things in chaos are pathological, but they're not good. But yet, much of chaos theory looks to be over in systems, in a, by stepping back from that system and recognizing the order that exists in something that appears to be chaos. Mm -hmm. It's multi dimensional, it is, it's, it's indeed a fractal. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that, that's patterns within patterns within patterns. But when, you're, you know, when you're inside one of the patterns, it appears chaotic, but yet it really isn't. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so, as we step back far enough, but some things that we call pathogenesis really are. Correct. It's a place of perspective. Correct. So, so this, which is really the mm -hmm. Yep. There may be an order which we do not necessarily perceive, perceive from our viewpoint. And, okay, so we get from a philosophical standpoint, we understand as chiropractors that there's order and reason for everything mm -hmm. through intelligent design. Mm -hmm. and those things, what we call pathology, may actually be adaptive mechanisms of the physiology that's most honoring for the mm -hmm. form of that one time. Mm -hmm. What appears to say chaos may in fact not be. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. Well, interesting, interesting factoid we can also talk about. Um, in this exploration, I was looking at the relationship between cancer biology and chaos, and it's really actually fascinating. When the body starts a neoplastic process, there is an increasing disorder, but it is only when the, the neoplastic process coalesces into a proper tumor with structure that the, uh, the structure will create its own order, its own fractal pattern, which is separate and distinct than that found in the human body. It literally creates its own chaos system within the human body. It's almost like an alien kind of thing. Yeah. But really, I'm yeah. being serious. Yeah, very much. It's like it's creating its own little baby, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yep. It's so interesting. Yep. This is a whole, whole different perspective on how to maintain order, really. So, speaking of which, how does the body maintain order in a physical sense? Um, turns out there's a mechanism to maintain order. And I'm going to separate here very carefully innate intelligence from this one I'm about to discuss, central pattern generators. Central pattern generators are physical entities. And innate intelligence and the mental impulse are, of course, a bit distinct from that. So we're going to start this presentation, you know, this part of the presentation with that caveat. A central pattern generator is a biological neural network that produces patterned rhythmic outputs without sensory feedback. Feedback. They're self-sustaining. Breathing. Heartbeat. Well, we're going to get to that. Um, Two or more processes, or more, that interact such that each process sequentially increases, then decreases, and goes back to an initial state. So, central pattern generators in the human body create and maintain its intrinsic patterns. So, breathe in, breathe out. You don't necessarily voluntarily start or stop it, but... Um, it is self propagating. Is that still going okay? Yeah, just, do I need to click? Do I need to add these as they come up? It says add. Oh, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't know. That's what? that's important. You're the. You're the <laughs> <laughs> um, some examples of central pattern generators within the body include locomotion, and that is a very interesting case example we're going to explore more in just a minute. Um, swallowing, tongue movements respiration, and cicadic eye movements. So some interesting things that, I, that I'm going to point out on this slide. For example, um, reticular, for shoot, typo, reticular formation, nucleus tractus solitarius, hypoglossal nuclei, um, specifically the nucleus tractus solitarius. Anybody in the room think that might be impacted by sensory feedback from the chiropractic adjustment? What is it? It's a structure in the brain. Okay. It receives um, input, uh, proprioceptive input. Basically, proprioceptive input, so through spinocerebellar tracts, mm -hmm. goes into the cerebellum mm -hmm. and across the vermis to, to the vestigial nucleus and goes to a couple of different places. The nucleus tractus solitarius is one of them. Um, it's, there's a whole set of neurology 
which backs up the fact that sensory feedback alters the patterns created by central pattern generators. You just caught it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you guys know I love heart rate variability, so you know what I'm creeping up on here. Um, central pattern generators and cardiac control. Is there a discrete single central pattern generator that has been ad identified for cardiac control? No. <laughs> uh, what are the factors that are that influence cardiac control? Oh, there's tons of them. Um, biofeedback is one of them. Locomotion is one. Blood pressure, baroreceptor reflex. Um, yes, all of the above. So, so it's a really complicated picture, and a single central pattern generator has not yet been identified for the cardiac cycle in the human body. However, in lower vertebrae, sorry, my bad. Lower end, uh, the leech, it has there has been a central pattern generator identified that controls heart rate. Therefore, there is biological precedence, and this is kind of a what is new. It? Hmm? What is it? That in the leech. There's a set of two neurons which kind of cycle, but they're pretty simple. They have a heart. They have a what? A heart. Yeah. Yep. Well, or cardiac. I have to get back to you on that one. That was what I had. Uh, I read, so I'll do a little bit more. But I'm pretty sure it was the leech. Yeah, I was a little surprised by that because I was like, "Whoa!" But that's what it said. Um. There are some other folks who are also onto this idea that sensory input or a central pattern generator, central pattern generator could be important for the cardiac cycle. This is a real small print, so I'll have to look real careful. Silicon central pattern generators for cardiac diseases. We really are turning into cyborgs. Uh, this is a small medical device that has already been created, which modulates the uh, patterns of cardiac, um, the cardiac cycle. So that, the existence of that, uh, generalized patterns, like heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. um, my only reason for putting this up here is to simply support the contention that a central pattern generator for cardiac cycle does exist because someone's already modulated it. Therefore, it has to exist. Um, CPGs, and you caught this a minute ago, are modulated by sensory input. And I'm gonna go back again. Central pattern generator unto itself is a self-propagating plus, minus, plus, minus. So it has its own intrinsic activity. However, it can be modulated by outside input, neuromodulation. Define modulated. What's that? Define the word modulated. Changed. Upwards, downwards, pace, any of the above. So sensory input can change the activity of a central pattern generator. Thank you. Um, going back to Stevenson's principles. Every effect has a cause and every cause has effects. What we are doing with the chiropractic adjustment may have physically more profound effects than many people realize. And that brings up a great responsibility that we truly have. What is the relationship between innate intelligence and the collection of central pattern generators that uh, maintain various patterns within the body? I don't have an answer to this. This is an interesting idea that I've been kind of tossing around in my head. I don't think all the central pattern generators in the human body have been identified. You know, it's clear that the human body is a chaos system. And what controls it? We still don't know. But there has to be some intrinsic relationship between those two. And I think that that's an interesting discussion uh, for the philosophically minded. The function of innate intelligence is to adapt universal forces and matter for use in the body so that all parts of the body will have coordinated action for mutual benefit. The central pattern generators are multiple and they're separate from one another. Something has to coordinate them. What is that? Um, 
we're going to take a step aside here and talk about how well does a chaos system work? Is it working at its best? Is it inhibited for some reason? Um, so what optimizes the efficiency of a chaos system? We're going to go back to the example of locomotion. So you can actually find this in Wikipedia. If you have a pebble in your shoe, your gait cycle will change to accommodate, to adapt for the pebble in the shoe. That is an adaptation. Um, perhaps if the pebble weren't there and the pattern persisted, it would become labeled a maladaptation. Nonetheless, sensory input from a pebble in the shoe will alter the gait cycle, the locomotion cycle, that is governed by a central pattern generator. What does that say about chiropractic? Subluxation can interfere with the movement. Yep. It's CPG and alter. Yep. And then it goes the other way too. It could correct the subluxation. Yep. Alter. We're talking about the safety pin cycle. Yep. Very much so. So, another interesting level to this if you had a pebble in the shoe and the person that were also subluxated, whether that's a motion restriction, a neurological control abnormality, just generalized irritation, any of the above, that was preventing freedom of movement in the body. If you remove that pebble, what's going to happen to that maladaptation? It won't clear. That may be the basis for where people get patterns upon patterns upon patterns of maladaptations. If their body has not been free enough to readapt to its initial state. Again, an initial state is very important to a chaos system. You guys having fun so far? Am I feeding anybody's brains? Okay. Yes. Cool. Um, so, remove the pebble from the shoe. Either physically, remove the pebble from the shoe and allow the body to readapt, reacclimate, and reset. Or, as Nathan was talking about, an adjustment. What does that do? It could provide sensory input to the central pattern generator, basically hitting the reset button. And then the system can rebalance itself from the inside out. Wait, what does it sound like? You still have to move the pebble. Yeah, totally. Yeah, but they're both important. Mm -hmm. The integrity of the structure as a whole its freedom, its coordination, and its movement are all essential for the ability to adapt or clear out a maladaptation. If there's any obstruction to any of those, you will end up with a maladaptive pattern. So then all the self-care that we offer to people, um, really has a, that, that has a major effect. Like if they keep doing it, if they keep the pebble in their shoe and get adjusted, 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 you're not going to be able to help yep. that pattern shift, so yep. they have to take some responsibility yep. in that process. I agree wholeheartedly. If someone has a motion pattern that they repeat every single time, like sitting there with their legs crossed the same way every single day, we can adjust them until the cows come home, but the pebbles still in the shoe. They go back into the wrong shoes again, and they're uneven, and they have to be adjusted again. Mm -hmm. Yep. Tread wear on shoes is really important because it's going to affect the locomotion pattern, which will create an adaptive or maladaptive pattern. And the greater importance of that is not even necessarily just that maladaptive pattern, but the overall irritation and nociception that is directed towards the central nervous system. Input drives output. The more irritated it is, according to Chestnut's hypothesis, is a physical stressor in the body, which will have physiological output and readouts. So, hypothesis. I think this will be something that will be fun for us all to play with in the next couple of years, decades, who knows. The chiropractic adjustment creates and, um, and or corrects sensory input to central pattern generators within the body, within the chaos system that is the human body, and the system will adapt according to the input that it receives, and the human body will change its trajectory because you have affected the initial conditions. You and I have talked about pinball. When you give someone an adjustment, we're not necessarily in control of exactly what the body does with that specific adjustment. And that's very similar to playing pool. 
Um, I'm not on that good of a pole, so I'm not really in control of where things go, but very few people are. So when we give the adjustment, we have to trust the body will do what it needs to do. And that goes back not to the central pattern generators, but to innate intelligence and the freedom within the body and neurological and structural integrity to accept the adjustment and make the best use of it as possible. So, how could we possibly measure if the body is uh, making biological improvements in the chaos system according to um, the chiropractic adjustment? I don't know. What's my favorite topic in the whole wide world? Heart rate. <laughs> could that be it? Um, heart rate variability. For those in the audience who may not be completely familiar with it yet, is micro variation in the distance between adjacent heartbeats. Low heart rate variability is actually bad. High heart rate variability is actually good. It's kind of counterintuitive, um, but. There it is. And that's based on a ton of different literature, not in the chiropractic literature at all, in the greater medical literature. There's like 20,000 several references at this point. Some of the latest references are actually talking about heart rate variability as a reflection of adaptability in the body. Who in the room thinks that's kind of neat? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the reference to that paper will be included in, in the paper that's coming out in six days. Six days. Six days. I hate waiting. I've been waiting for like five months for this. Oh, we'll get back there. Sorry. Is heart rate variability a chaos process in the first place? And the answer to that from the medical literature is actually a resounding yes. I'm not going to go through each of these studies, but I'm just going to show you a little selection. Chaos theory, heart rate variability, and arrhythmic mortality. Um, yeah, the American Heart Association is under this. Chaotic signatures of heart rate variability as power spectrum and health, aging, and heart failure. Could that be important? Hmm. Um, chaotic signatures of HRV as power spectrum. Oh, one. Sorry. And prognostic value. Oh, this is, <laughs> this is a good one. Prognostic value of heart rate variability in the elderly, changing the perspective. This, all of this material is actually fairly recent in the medical community. Changing the perspective from sympathetic vagal balance to chaos theory. So yes, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic do modulate heart rate variability. But like Peter is talking about, levels of magnification, there appears to be a bigger picture. So let's talk a little bit about subluxation. Stevenson's principles, again. 29, interference with transmission of innate forces. That can happen. The cause of disease, interference with transmission of innate forces causes incoordination or dis-ease. Subluxations, interference with transmission of the body is always directly or indirectly due to subluxations in the spinal column. Therefore, my next question will be, if HRV is a chaos process, and subluxation affects the sensory input to its central pattern generator, then the chiropractic adjustment should modulate heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. And you guys in the room, you know me for a little while, you know what the answer is. It is, again, a resounding yes. This is not just my work. There's been a couple other awesome papers that have come out pretty recently. Curtis Fedorchek has one recently, and Danny Knowles has another recently. So these are different uh, approaches to uh, chiropractic, and these are different techniques. It, it actually doesn't matter whether you're talking about um, coherence or SSDN or different measures of heart rate variability. The bottom line, heart rate variability changes with the adjustment. Blue bars are before the adjustment. Red bars are after the adjustment. There's some interesting things on this slide, and this one's actually not in the paper. This is some background work, but this is some totally fun information. Um, going back to our question, are we necessarily in ultimate control of what any intelligence does with, with the adjustment? No. Sometimes heart rate variability goes up. Sometimes it goes down. 
And maybe that was an appropriate physiological adaptation in that particular case. But the majority of the time, and I've been studying this for about three years, the majority of the time, heart rate variability does change with the adjustment. And often when it doesn't, there's an underlying reason for that that we can uncover. So, um, uh, here, we come, here we come to the fun stuff. In six days, this paper will be released from the Chiropractic Journal of Australia. This is an open source publication, and when the publication is released, I'll post a link here on this site, and we'll just spread it far and wide. Um, it's going to be PubMed indexed, which is kind of interesting to me as a nerdy scientist, and it contains a couple of our favorite terms, like sublocalization, adjustment, all that fun stuff. Um, and it shows that heart rate variability in this six-case retrospective study not only increased in a dose-dependent manner, meaning not just one adjustment, but a series of adjustments. Just like it's not one workout, but a series of adjust series of workouts that creates change in the body. The red dots here are the people's initial heart rate variability. The blue dots that follow are improvements over heart rate variability over a course of care. This person happened to be, that is 25 months of care. This is three months of care, two and a half months of care, eight months of care, 30 months of care. What we're looking at here is an increase in heart rate. This is baseline heart rate variability taken before an adjustment goes up with care and stays up. I'm going to go back to the idea that, that heart rate variability is a reflection of adaptation of the chaos system that is the human body to its environment. What this data is suggesting is that we, with our adjustments, are literally physiologically affecting a chaos process, removing an obstruction that is preventing the chaos system from balancing itself from the inside out. And the outcome from that is what we see in our patients every day, improved health. Amy, are there any other variables that could affect that? A ton. Well, I'm not sure if the naysayers would look at that and say, okay, so what were you, were you giving, feeding them something in the office? Were you giving them something to drink in the office? Were you hugging them? Were you, I mean, does that make sense as a scientist? It totally does. And that's actually one of the unique points about this paper is I looked at the greater literature and there are several variables that need to be eliminated to keep the picture as clean as possible. For instance, these uh, the people that were in the case study right there, they were um, these were baseline measurements. So none of them were under emotional physical stress at the time we took their baseline measurement. That's a pretty big variable. Um, none of them were under um, none of them were taking medications which might alter their heart rate variability. There are a series of important variables that all need to be taken into account in order to get good data. And that is actually, um, it's covered in the paper that's coming out, and that's something that the workshop series that I talked about, how to use heart rate variability really effectively and use it well in your practice to convey the overall value of the care that we're providing, that's part of what's going to be in the workshop. Great question, and thank you. A lot of variables. It's not as easy as it seems because, again, the human body is a chaos system. So, does change in heart rate variability with the chiropractic adjustment or with an entire course of care represent change in change creation for an opp an opportunity for adaptation within the human body and results in optimization within a chaos system from the adjustment? Just something to think about, something for us to consider, something uh, perhaps to guide the future research. I don't need to say a word about that. <laughs> so, is there precedence for the idea that the chiropractic adjustment affects the central pattern generator? Do you know where I'm going with this? Absolutely, yes. Simon Senzon and Donnie Epstein, beautiful work. This has already been shown. So we're seeing different lines of evidence which are converging to the same conclusion. 
that what we are doing as chiropractors, resolving subluxation, locating and correcting vertebral subluxation with the chiropractic adjustment, the effect of our work may be to optimize the function of a chaos system, to release it from constraints that are preventing it from working at its best from the inside out. So, neat! In theory. Um, so this is all theory. This is MACP. I'm playing. These are the thoughts that run around in my head, and I told you guys I was going to show the contents of my brain. It's really scary up here sometimes, so... Um, <laughs> how do I... You know, anyways, so how do we actually test this hypothesis? How can we logistically use this information? How do we apply it to further chiropractic research and, and chiropractic philosophy? And think about that the art of chiropractic. Can you leverage the observed HRV improvements that are um, that both Curtis and, and Daniel Knowles and I have uh, recently published? Can we leverage these improvements to forward our field in a way that is philosophically and biologically congruent? One of the best things about measuring heart rate variability and using it as an objective outcome indicator, it is a whole body health and adaptability metric. We're not focusing our patients on the improvements of their, their muscle balance, though that is really important, or their posture, though that is really important. We can focus our patients on the bigger picture, what's happening with their health. Yes? Could you, could you, could you say some more about that? Because I think it's fantastic as a central indicator. Uh, so my sense for it is heart rate variability is essentially the body back the way so that needs to do it. Vision activity and then it settles right back down again if you're sitting down. And it activates if you have to go out and get the mail, mm -hmm. it goes up and then it sits back down. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so when that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. why is that? Is it, I mean, you know, I know you could say the person sub uh Anything else you'd like to share? Heart rate variability. What's that? What causes the lack of the lack of responsiveness? Um, I'm going to go back to Stevenson's principles, limits of adaptation, and that covers a pretty broad swath. Whether it's the bare receptors are not executing appropriate response, if they're not sensitive enough, if the vessel walls are uh, have have pathology in them, if there are other considerations, there can be a ton of different things. But the bottom line is exactly what you're talking about. When someone is not perceiving their environment appropriately and responding appropriately to what the body sees in the environment, that is a reduction in adaptation. And that is a central threat to vitality and human health. Adaptability is life. I think Darwin said something about that. Adapter, die, or something. Mm -hmm. so, so, in aging, mm -hmm. There are certain things that would happen to the heart in aging, right? I mean, it's, mm -hmm. we assume that it, it's harder for the heart over the years, it's been pumping, 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 um, to project the blood out, out of it. And mm -hmm. so, as somebody gets older, have you, like in the literature, does it talk about as a population, do older people have less adaptability? And, and could we separate them out? And let's, you know, I mean, could you separate it out and, and take some of your patient practice members who are older and say, wow, well, they are not like the norm. You can do that? Um, you that? The reason I'm so excited with that question, yeah. you've nailed it on the head, like you always do. Um, it turns out that in the literature, was that? I think. You, 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 perfect. Perfect. Um, it turns out in the literature there is a relationship between longevity and good heart rate variability, such that reduced heart rate variability <clears throat> predicts mort all cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, uh, metabolic syndrome, cancer, not even correlated, predicts. So that's some powerful math. And it appears, when you look at the graph, because I'm a nerd and I read the paper, um, when you look at the graph, it goes, do, 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 and then the graph goes like this. And when you look at the graph, you're like, that's not right. Well, it turns out the only data points they could collect on the upswing 
with the older people who are still alive. And coincidentally, they have higher heart rate variability. Yeah, well, like my parents are going to be 90 and then get, get adjusted. Mm -hmm. Like, since my father since he was 15, yeah. my mom mm -hmm. said she was 19, and yeah. they've been going yeah. twice a week for like, you know, yeah. 30 years. Could it be? She's the magical child. She is. Uh, Could it be <laughs> that by improving heart rate variability, we, the adjustment, I don't, I don't even say we because we're catalysts. I just work here. <laughs> you know? The chiropractor delivering the adjustment is helping the human chaos system, the body, to enhance its heart rate variability. And in doing so, adding life to years and years to life. It's possible. I think that, um, as a scientist, of course, I have to back down off of that and say, that will require some further study and quantitative analysis. It's possible. Yeah, I think we should explore that. I think that there's a really interesting story that we need to be looking at here. Well, if they could decide that this pattern is the heart pattern because it shows up on a population, or that this is kind of the range of blood pressure, I mean, you know, you could show up with statistics that say this is what we see in our people that get adjusted versus people we don't. So, anyway. Wouldn't that be neat? This is a pilot study. Mm -hmm. This is the first round of data. Other people have seen this as well. Mm -hmm. But this may, yes, quantitatively describe a difference between people who do get adjusted and people who don't get adjusted in terms of their literal adaptability. I think that'd be a great study. Um, I think that's where we should go. So what are the places we should go? Okay, I think that's actually, yep, yeah, that's all I had. Um, has everybody had their brain kind of fed a little bit? Oh yeah, jump started. Cool. Cool. All right, so my thinking is not like out there. This is... Oh, right on. Yeah. Okay, all right. This is why it's been on our side. We need you. So as far as the variability <laughs> that's... What's that? Are you variability that's your thing, right? Yeah. Is there something else that's your thing with regard to research? Um, that's kind of what has my my attention. my attention right now. There's some other topics that definitely have my attention, but there's only one of me, and I, I I'm cloning me is a really scary proposition. Linda, <laughs> 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 do you have a question? I do. Yeah. So, inter-user reliability in machinery, I don't, I've never seen the device. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, unlike, you know, scanners, which you can, just the slightest deviation mm -hmm. methodology can alter the metric? Yep, that's a fantastic question. Uh, the first person that I would refer you to with that question will actually be Dave Fletcher. But I will give you a little bit of background on that because that, that yeah. pulse rate profile is, um, is validated. Um, but yes, there's a lot of intrinsic variability, and the reason for that is actually totally cool. There is intrinsic variability in day-to-day, -day, after a workout, and that's why people use this, to track their, their uh, readiness for a workout, because it's known that this is going to change. Now, one of the shortcomings that I, have, I, I think I'm observing in the greater literature is their standard error bars are whacked out. Um, that doesn't mean much to anybody except me because I'm a nerd. But what that means to me is there's a systematic error somewhere. And I believe the systematic error is that we really should compare one person to themselves rather than to other people. When you take a large group of people who have intrinsically different measurements on an intrinsically labile parameter, you're going to get a mess. And that's what the literature shows. Mm -hmm. That said, when you dissect the variables and look at one person compared to themselves, controlling for lifestyle factors and um, making sure that nothing else is changing in the course of care, that's when this pattern starts to appear. What about the hardware? That's another interesting question. I do not have a good answer for that. Um, that's something I want to explore. I think we need to. 
recall when you were talking about carbonate variability before, you, you mentioned that green tea was effective in uh, helping heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. In the uh, one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fair enough. You can do some research and get back to me. I have done some research mm -hmm. on a on a uh, individual compared to an individual level, and it is very helpful. Green tea, huh? Yeah. I'm not giving up coffee. I need a mic, but green tea is a nice compliment. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's it. Um, two comments. One, um, Seth, I had the, the exact same question Seth. I had asked Chris Kent that question about a year and a half, two years ago. Which question? Uh, is the uh, reliability, the reproducibility of the data. Yeah. And he basically said exactly what David said, I'm using really fancy words. Uh, basically, that uh, you're using HRV as a measure to the person themselves. And you're watching the changes to themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very well established in the literature um, how, how well it's accepted. So it's not just a chiropractic tool, it's, it's utilized across mm -hmm. the healthcare sciences and yep. the research. 20,000 references in the PubMed literature. Yeah, so really so the, the, the validation of it is very good. He also, the, the other thing that he said is, is um, with technology today, although the sensor itself uh, can vary, uh, a lot can be done mathematically um, within the computer program to cancel out noise. Mm -hmm. and, and he said that's really where the, what we keep doing all the sophistication come in in HRV and its application is the development of the software side of it to cancel out data, to extract from it uh, germane data to make um, predictability and assessment of human physiology. Did I say that well? You did, and I'm really excited because there's a particular technology that we can talk about later that I'm looking to purchase um, as a component of a uh, grant proposal that I put in, and I think it could, it's exactly what we're looking for, signal to noise ratio and reproducibility as something that can really get us some good data about this, because this data that I showed you does not show direct cause and effect. It shows a correlation. It shows that heart rate variability is sustained over a course of care. That said, I have done the experiment where you have someone, you measure their heart rate directly, heart rate variability directly before the adjustment, and then directly afterwards, and nothing else changes. That is highly suggestive that the adjustment is executing the change. But doing that in live time would be a very different conclusion. And that's something that I'm interested in doing. We'll, we'll see where that goes. You, you bring up a really interesting point, and this is a discussion that I actually had with Dave Fletcher, that this heart rate variability as a measurement of human adaptability and a reflection of what chiropractic care does for the human body, heart rate variability is something that we, as a profession, we need to hop on this boat. We need to own this, because if we don't, someone else will. This is potentially poised to really reflect the value 